Now let's take a look at the effects of too little calcium. The first one is really kind of tricky, but it's really pretty important. The reason that it's tricky is one would assume, one would assume that having less calcium outside the cell would mean less positive charges leaking into the cell, resulting in hyperpolarization. So one of the great paradoxes is to understand how low calcium actually causes hyperexcitability. So it's a bit paradoxical then that decreased calcium actually leads to depolarization and hyperexcitability. I guess I have a little background in electrophysiology and in measuring electrical currents across the cell, and so I kind of understand this or I've seen this develop, that if you don't have the right amount of calcium when you're recording currents across cell membranes, it leads to spurious results, weird results. And the main theory that electrophysiologists or patch clampers always had was that there's slight negative charges on the outside of a cell, and those negative charges need to be balanced by calcium. Calcium is the only ion small enough to get in there. It's not even small enough to get in there, but it carries a huge water shell, and so calcium is the only ion on the outside of the cell small enough to get in there and balance these negative charges created by proteins on the outside of the cell. So what happens if there's not as much calcium, there's less shielding of these negative charges on the outside of the cell, so the outside of the cell is more negative. This lessens how negative the inside of the cell is in comparison, and the effect then is that the cell has what looks like a, a more positive voltage on the membrane. This means it's closer to its threshold and it's hyperexcitable. In neurons, the effect of hypocalcemia can be kind of unpredictable. We're just going to say it causes neuronal abnormalities. In muscle, clearly it can cause muscle spasms because that muscle is more likely to contract, and that's why decreases in calcium can lead to cramping. In osteomalacia, decreased calcium can cause the bones to become soft, and this can happen in adults. Adult bones can be, become soft. In rickets, it's actually the growth plate that becomes soft and expands. It causes knocked knees, and it's kind of the large knees here. So osteomalacia is the bowing of the femur. Rickets is the expansion of the growth plate, and that really can only occur in kids because only kids have growth plates. And adults' lack of calcium can lead to osteoporosis. And also, because of this effect on calcium, a decrease in calcium can mean hydrogen has to bind to the albumin now, that's going to cause alkalosis because that hydrogen is going to be bound up by the albumin. This also then can lead to hypokalemia because if you decrease the amount of H, you decrease the amount of potassium, and that causes hypokalemia. Let's jump up here to the effects of hypercalcemia. And it's going to be fairly similar, although in the opposite direction, to the effects of hypocalcemia. And now there's more calcium to shield those negative charges on the outside of the protein. And so this causes hyperpolarization because the inside of the cell now seems more negative because the outside of the cell is more positive. In the neuron then, this can just cause general abnormalities that are kind of hard to predict. In the heart, the hyperpolarization can slow down the heart rate and, and decrease contractility enough to lead to cardiac arrest. Technically, the increased calcium will enter faster during the depolarization phase. But since the cell is hyperpolarized, it takes longer to become depolarized. When muscles are hyperpolarized, it becomes harder for them to contract. So hypercalcemia causes muscles to weaken. This again is paradoxical because you'd assume that more calcium is available for contraction, which, which would make the muscle stronger. But the effect of calcium on hyperpolarizing the membrane overshadows the excess calcium. The lack of muscle activity can also inhibit digestion in the GI tract and cause nausea. The other thing is, is increased calcium for some reason seems to enhance acid production in the stomach. And again, it could come down to this down here where increased calcium increases the available acid. So that also contributes to the nausea. Too much calcium obviously can also cause calcification or formation of bone where you don't really want it. So that can be kidney stones, gallstones, things like that. It can also cause fatty plaques to calcify, hardening up artery leading to arteriosclerosis. Our one last step then in discussing these calcium imbalances is to talk about how the body is going to ameliorate this. Essentially, calcium is regulated by the thyroid and the parathyroid, which is associated with the thyroid, small little glands on the back side of the thyroid. In the case of too little calcium, the parathyroid gland puts out parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone activates osteoclasts. If you activate osteoclasts, they pull calcium out of the bone. Parathyroid also stimulates the kidney to make additional vitamin D. Technically, skin makes vitamin D, but kidney activates that vitamin D to vitamin D3 that is actually active in the absorption of calcium from the gut. And so the kidney can increase the production of vitamin D3 to increase absorption of calcium in the gut. The other thing parathyroid hormone does is it increases calcium and phosphate reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule of the kidney. 
If calcium gets too high, the thyroid releases calcitonin, and calcitonin stimulates the opposing cell, the osteocyte. And the osteocyte will take that additional calcium and make bone, getting rid of it. So we'll have bone deposition. Also, increased calcium will inhibit parathyroid hormone, so it'll inhibit all of these. Inhibit osteoclasts, inhibit the production of vitamin D3 from the kidney, and inhibit increased calcium absorption, so more calcium will actually be excreted. I think that wraps up calcium, so thank you.